Vertigo is Alfred Hitchcock's tale of twisted romance, an exemplary case of love at first sight. The magic compulsions of a man in love are captured so astutely so as to almost appear like parody, and perhaps that's because it is. Vertigo at first incorporates the sincere complications of a detective's falling head over heels while on duty, a standard, seemingly predictable plotline. Familiar in a way, and maybe what many Americans at the time would have expected and hoped to see. And yet, it isn't until the second half that Vertigo shows its true colors, gripping whatever warmth or romance remained of the smoldering first half and dashing it against the blades of obsession and self-destruction. Hitchcock murders the smallest hint or hope of romantic redemption through the manic pursuits of a haunted lover shackled by the past hell-bent on repeating it. Vertigo's tale of sentimentalism, taken to a slaughtering degree, paints its male figure in a morbid light. The femme fatale falls to the wayside of the male fatale, a man who is more dangerous to himself than anyone else. One final thing I have to do, and then I'll be free of the past. Vertigo follows John Ferguson, who also goes by Scotty, a retired police investigator, played by James Stewart, who is ailed by a crippling fear of heights, giving way to his vertigo. He finds himself drawn back into duty after an old friend, Gavin Elster, asks for a special favor. The job? To follow the man's wife and monitor her actions, taking note of all her strange rituals and how they relate to a hidden and sordid past. The man believes his wife is haunted by her great-grandmother, Carlotta Valdes, and fears that, in her possession, she is liable to commit suicide just as Carlotta did. Initially, the job is taken from afar. Scotty is nothing more than a pair of peering eyes and a set of shoes that follow, but once he is forced to save Madeline from unknowingly drowning in San Francisco Bay, and as his job extends to the role of protector, over this mentally unstable angel, he finds himself deeply drawn to the woman, and pulled in closer than he'd ever imagined. Vertigo's first half is truly innocuous, a standard noir unpacking its mystery and establishing an invested male protagonist. Just as unassuming is its tale of quick romance, Love at first sight is a common movie trope, but it is after the untimely death of Madeline and the devastation heaped upon Scotty thereafter that all expectations are subverted. Tragedy striking is not a unique plot point, but certainly, Scotty's strategy for reconciliation is what sets Vertigo apart from anything else of the time. Gee, you, you have got a bad, haven't you? Do I really look like it? The meat of Vertigo begins with the discovery that Madeline, the one who Scotty interacted with all that time, was never quite Madeline at all, but an actress hired by Gavin to portray his wife. The woman Scotty loved wasn't Madeline, but a woman named Judy. Vertigo's great reveal is that Gavin Elster's job was the perfect cover for an elaborately planned murder. In hiring Judy to act as his wife and play out the role of a possessed and suicidal wanderer, tasking Scotty with observing all the while, he weaves the believable story that his wife would kill herself if given the chance, and uses Scotty as a witness. With the plan gone accordingly, Gavin slithers away, and Scotty is left to his own private devastation. From here on out, the details of the crime take a back seat to the score of emotions plaguing Scotty, who is placed in recovery. Weighed down by a melancholia, Scotty roams San Francisco, searching fruitlessly for the ghost of Madeline, retracing her steps as he remembers them. Madeline seems gone for good, until Scotty spots a catching face, a beauty that is too familiar to pass up, the face of Judy. And it's here that a withering Scotty is served the once-in-a-lifetime chance to love a dead woman all over again.
just like that. Sing for me, please. Romantic tragedy and the chance at redemption are also themes of 1998's Cowboy Bebop, a beloved anime contemplated to this day for its tale of male detachment and self-destructive obsession with the past. Its depiction of self-destruction and denial in the face of fortunate circumstance hits home with a young male audience who, like the character of Spike Spiegel, carry a fear of human bond due to past pain. How old wounds can prevent us from cherishing our here and now in the present is perhaps the anime's hardest-hitting theme. The series' closing statement, You're going to carry that weight, can be read into this interpretation. You'll inevitably feel hurt, experience pain, and carry heavy emotional weight. That is a constant of the human experience. But your choice in the matter is whether to let that baggage infect everything you touch. Can you learn to coexist with that pain and live a full life regardless? Are you capable of living as though you've never died? Of loving as though you've never been hurt before? Spike isn't, and for much of the show, Faye Valentine, Spike's potential romantic redeemer, isn't capable either. How two people meant to be matched can so blindly avoid their fates at all times isn't such a frustrating fact of the show as it is tragic. Deep sorrow comes from the realization that a great opportunity is being cast away like it was nothing. Even if Faye comes around too little too late, the timing never would have mattered. Spike wasn't ever going for it. If he really wanted to, he could have learned to move on from the past. To carry that weight with a smile and love Faye as if she were his first. But for some stone-cold reason, he doesn't. And with certainty, with his back to the warmth, he walks out on a beautiful second chance. If I had the nerve, I'd stay and lie, hoping that I could make you love me again. As I am for myself. And so forget the other and forget the past. But I don't know whether I have the nerve to try. If Cowboy Bebop's drawing theme is that of missed redemption and the ultimate rejection of a second chance, then Vertigo is the progenitor of that message, a highly recognizable inspiration amidst the anime's entourage of Western influences, the grandfather of the romantic sabotage theme. The tragedy of Vertigo is that Scotty could have had it all once more. After Madeline dies, he mourns her greatly, reduced to not much more than a walking ghost without her around. Losing her is like losing everything. He falsely sees her in other women, tricked by cars, clothes, the habits of hers that others share. Desperately, he scrounges to find her again. Everything that comprised the idea of Madeline is what he looks for and is fooled by. But Judy is a different story. He notices instantly that she looks just like Madeline, and it's this striking similarity that draws him in. He cinches a date with Judy without knowing that she was Madeline, the woman portraying her anyways. In finding Judy, Scotty has, in effect, found Madeline once again. Though she doesn't wear the same clothes, speak just as Madeline did, nor pin her hair up just so, she obviously has the face and the soul that Scotty remembers. Judy should be enough for Scotty. She's who he loved, really, even if he doesn't know it. But he does know, otherwise he wouldn't have showed up at her apartment. On some level, he understands that, with her, he has a second chance. The freedom to love Judy now as he actually loved her before, without strings attached. Rid of the facade. Just when he thought Madeline was gone forever, he's handed the rare chance to be with her all over again. As Scotty says, not many people get a second chance like this. I just want to be with you as much as I can, Judy. But is it love that Scotty wants, or the notion of it? The stiffness and impersonality of their walk in the park, their dinner, and their dance drags difficult and unresolved emotions into what should be a joyous time. Scotty, despite having found his Madeline once more, the truest version of her, unmasked and out of character, is restless, picky, 
and hardly satisfied. Scotty doesn't love Judy, and for that, he proves that he didn't love Madeline either. He loved who she played, the concept of the woman. He loved the idea of her, and so that's what he rebuilds. Hair, clothes, tragedy, and all. Well? I should be back from your face and pinned at the neck. I told her that. I told you that. The starkness of his unromantic obsession is what haunts Vertigo's second half and cements it with immense thematic weight. In Cowboy Bebop fashion, Scotty, as Spike does in the anime, fixates himself on what was, and in doing so neglects just what it is that he has. The parallels are undeniable. Spike loses Julia prior to the events of the show, and it's this trauma which holds him back preventing him from forming a real emotional bond with the Bebop crew. Because of his past misery, he forbids himself from the chance of partaking in this happenstance gathering of unlikely friends, the family that he never had. Specifically, Faye is his second chance at romance, or at least she could have been. Spike and Faye, despite seeming destined for some kind of intimacy, never fulfill that romance which the viewer may anticipate. It's a bond never cinched, a hole never filled, and by the series' end, it's a gap that hurts to see go unclosed. Where opportunity stared him in the face, Spike evaded the chance and, more than once, self-destructively ensured he'd never have it again. And after second chance after second chance, his seemingly endless luck eventually ran out, and for the last time, he denied the fortunate offer to rebuild. But where Spike's story is characteristically amiss and detached, tragic because he is so often emotionally disinterested, Scotty from Vertigo plays a much more obsessed and troubling role. Similarly, he does treat Judy with a stark and undeserving coldness, but what follows is not amiss, but highly involved and precise. A craftsman's disturbing reconstruction of the past, where Spike allows his past to haunt him by sitting and simmering in the background, Scotty drags it violently to the forefront of his present. With fervor, he reconstructs the woman he once knew, inch by inch, and in this way fates himself to lose her all over again. In his obsession, he molds Judy to look, talk, and die just as Madeline did before. In his supposed pursuit to correct the past, he aggressively rebuilds the tragedy, and the intensity of his intent paints it something dark and self-destructive, implosive, sentimental perhaps, but to a sabotaging degree. Like Cowboy Bebop, Vertigo's great tragedy is that of missed redemption, the soiling of a second chance. Scotty aggressively recreates the tragedy of Madeline's death in his manic pursuit to correct the past. Obsession turns a second chance into repeated history, and his fixation on what was loses him his love for certain. What he says gratingly to Judy shortly before her own demise is in fact a lesson for himself and the flash of self-awareness can almost be detected in the delivery. And the necklace, Carlotta's necklace. There was where you made your mistake, Judy. You shouldn't keep souvenirs of a killing. You shouldn't have been... You shouldn't have been that sentimental. Cowboy Bebop hurts. You wince at Spike's sheer disregard for romance and his abject rejection of redemption. But Vertigo leaves a different taste. Something deeper, darker, and more nefarious. Between Spike and Scotty, most young men today likely relate more to Spike. His Clint Eastwood charm and cool disinterest in everything and everyone around him makes for a memorable anti-hero. A cautionary icon, just as troubled as he is appealing. Spike is almost someone you'd want to replicate if you didn't know any better. But there's no mistaking Scotty's pathology. Scotty is no one to be admired. Spike is a western archetype with much of the mythology removed. 
a clear critique of Western emotional detachment, but nonetheless tame enough to be misread by a young male viewer. But Scotty's obsession comes off so strong in Vertigo, so as to be unmistakable for anything else. Spike's rare moments of unspoken emotional vulnerability give a glimpse into his hidden half. A heart still beats after all. He knows love somewhere. He can therefore be sympathized with. Spike spells despair, a young man without regard for life. But Scotty spells trouble, a violent obsessive, bound to hurt not just himself, but another too. Like those masculine characters who inspired him, Spike does yearn for a connection somewhere under the guise. A man condemned to see the past in one eye and the present in another. It's not so much his fault that he's incapable of living and loving in the moment. On some level, he does regret that he cannot share love. Though it's unclear whether it's love that Scotty ever wanted at all. Even if he's fully able. If love was all he wanted, then Judy would have been enough, but she wasn't. In the face of a fresh beginning, with nothing stopping him from building a beautiful new start, Scotty has to resurrect the woman who he lost, and passionately sets the stage to lose her again. Whatever deviations exist in the characters of Spike and Scotty, the two certainly share those deepest impulses. An attraction to disaster, a mistress in sabotage, returning to her, always. Where are you going? As Spike once died at a church, so did Scotty, emotionally at least. Symbolically a place of great trauma, the church, in both Cowboy Bebop and Vertigo, is equally a location of unrelenting fixation, a beacon of self-destruction for two men hopelessly attracted to tragedy. Where Spike goes to die again, unsuccessfully, Scotty goes to be heartbroken once more. Spike may be implicitly suicidal, but Scotty is just as reckless. Both acts are effectively self-harming, detrimental to the sanctity of their respectively bright futures. The key difference being that, arguably, something in Spike leads him to the church. His malfunction is that the past never eludes his gaze and his consideration, like being led along by someone who isn't really there. It's hard to claim that Spike's decisions are 100% his own. Who's to say that he isn't simply operating on autopilot? But Scotty seeks the church with two good eyes. A man's eyes, and it's that absolute, conscious willingness which boggles the mind. That Scotty and Spike, two very similar, yet nonetheless fundamentally different characters, one more awake and more man than the other, find themselves brought to that same temple of demise, speaks to the indiscriminate nature of self-sabotage. All lives can be wrecked by those who can't help themselves, just as certainly as by those who can. I made it. I made it. Vertigo is the most potent exploration of romantic sabotage that I've seen. Though Cowboy Bebop tackles remarkably similar motifs, there's an undeniable element of sympathy and male appeal existent in the character of Spike, potentially shrouding the innermost caution of its tragedy. But that ethos is so demented in Vertigo Scotty, so sick and unrelenting, that relatability or idolatry hardly exists alongside the prevailing emotions of dread and incredulity. Spike is confused, led and condemned by impulses which he may not have full dominion over. A man worthy of sympathy, if only because he is to some extent helpless. But Scotty, as an unquestionably willing participant in the slaughter of his own happiness, is a specimen to be examined, embodying a disease. A disease which Cowboy Bebop looks to cure, yet doesn't identify so unadulterated 
has vertigo. Look at my eyes, Faye. One of them is a fake because I lost it in an accident. Since then, I've been seeing the past in one eye and the present in the other. Never the whole picture. Spike is such a legend in the lexicon of troubled male characters in fiction. Something of a mascot for all young men on the internet. While Scotty, despite not just undergoing, but actively creating a very similar tragedy to that of Spike's, and serving as likely influence for Spike and Cowboy Bebop as a whole, simply isn't viewed with the same dreamy gaze. The reason being that Spike can reasonably be mistaken for a whole host of things, cool, heroic, and maybe even a victim. What primarily appeals about a character like Spike is that he is depicted as the player in a world much larger and more decided than himself, the power removed from the man. Stories like his do tend to culminate with the explosive actions of a man with nothing left to lose. Yet it is the precursing sensations of powerlessness which often find reprisal in online circulation. What is remembered of Blade Runner 2049? Officer K's rescue of Rick Deckard in a move which ultimately defines him as his own man at last? Or a minuscule Officer K alongside the predominant, purple, corporate joy? What is clung onto most fondly are those notions of powerlessness, the feeling that the world decides more than you ever will. It was never up to me to begin with. If ultimately cautionary, Spike's demise is depicted as not entirely his own doing. His inability to love and feel loved is not a conscious choice. It stems from something innate to his being which he didn't ask for. Spike is portrayed as helpless. There's nothing he or anyone else can do to help him. Spike is an unfortunate casualty. Perfectly self-destructive as he may be, Spike isn't quite regarded as a free agent. He is without full culpability. If given the capacity for choice, maybe he would have chosen differently. But Scotty is a normal man, regular enough to stay on police duty until his acrophobia set in. Wholly healthy aside from his fear of heights, Scotty's darker half comes as a surprise then. His catastrophic impulses are all the more disturbing when arising from a man who up to a point appeared like anyone else. His potential as bright and open as anyone else's. That we're so attracted to predetermination says something about us. Cowboy Bebop is oddly comforting in that Spike was never to have another ending. Despite whatever glimmer of a wish we can interpret from his rare emotional vulnerability, Spike's demise was the path unavoidable. And that's what makes Vertigo so particularly disturbing. That utter lack of predetermination, the openness of its road, the sheer limitless potential reached by the second act. Scotty is maybe that version of Spike which has agency and free choice. If he actually could have loved Faye, would he have? And Vertigo's answer is a shocking show of morbid fixation and life ruination even more brutal. That we choose hell of our own volition, with nothing keeping us from heaven and her lady, is both Vertigo's most valuable and stomach-churning notion. Cowboy Bebop is tragic because Spike is unwilling and unable to love. Vertigo is scary because Scotty is unwilling to love yet perfectly able. Thus, the common clinging to Spike as a self-portrait stems from some lower echelon of victimhood, a comfortable yet stagnant mindset, telling the world that this is all you are and ever will be. There's no fault, little blame. It's hard to finish Cowboy Bebop and feel that Spike's demise was entirely his own doing. Though regularly misinterpreted, Cowboy Bebop imparts warning, a message which does not fall on all ears. You who are not damned, who are able, let this not be your fate as well. God have mercy.
Cowboy Bebop hurts, but Vertigo pains me even more. Scotty is lucky. Met with that same fortunate circumstance which Spike is, yet uniquely equipped to enjoy it. However, as a comparison of Vertigo and Cowboy Bebop will prove, it's not only the ill-functioning brains which turn demented. Vertigo's most damning and most valuable lesson can be found in that realization that man does not need to be biologically altered to destroy his own chances. It is not just the characters in the myths that implode so carelessly. Vertigo is a fictional film, but because it does carry itself so much more seriously than Cowboy Bebop, grounded in San Francisco and playing by the rules of its present, it inherently imparts the lingering, bitter observation that such extravagant tragedies happen in reality too. The best of worlds, even. Casting James Stewart, the golden standard in acting, an ideal representative for the American man, in a film like Vertigo, was no accident. It was intentional, a calculated display of what even our heroes are capable of. Seamlessly closing the gap between average man and psycho is what cements Vertigo as subversive filmmaking. There's nothing particularly wrong with Scotty. His acrophobia is hardly a justification for all of the atrocity he commits. Where Spike is truly impaired, battling always with a sight split between past and present, succumbing as much to that hitch in his biology as he does to his willfully destructive mindset, Scotty is hardly so declared. Admittedly, neither man's fate was entirely set in stone. Spike did not have to throw Faye and the Bebop away. But where Spike is granted legitimate cause for that recklessness, Scotty simply isn't. If, if I let you change me, will I do it? Ironically, Scotty is such a repelling and unrelatable character for the sheer fact that he is a normal man. It is that nearly predetermined quality to Spike's tale, which fans are both fascinated and comforted by. That fictional, mythological flair to Cowboy Bebop imbues it with a magic and mystery which not only elevates the show's stature, but acquits Spike of absolute wrongdoing. A notion that many fans may like to apply in their own lives. Nobody is attracted to utter agency. 100% accountability is a disagreeable suggestion. We like to think that our villains and our heroes have their reasons and excuses, for if that is the case, we can use them too. Spike literally cannot see the full picture of his life. He must always view the past and present in tandem and thus in conflict. That is his reason, his excuse. But upon Vertigo's ultimate closure, my one biggest question is, where is Scotty's excuse? Scotty is so much closer to a man like myself than Spike, and it's that fact alone which fascinates and frightens me. In a heartbeat, I'd liken myself to Spike. There's an undeniable fun in that relation, maybe a dark and unrecognized comfort too. But to slowly realize all those similarities between myself and Scotty is surely less joyous, and not at all soothing. But nonetheless, it is one of the most important considerations that a classic film has initialized for me. Man needs nothing special to ruin his own life, to strangle the angel in his corner. No disease or shortcoming is required. Scotty may be marginally impaired by his acrophobia, but by all other means, he is a terribly normal man. Truly, his sickness runs much deeper than anything diagnosable. It could be reasonably argued that it is Spike's impairment which leads him down his ultimate path of self-destruction. His demise is certainly depicted as that of a victim, a man without the proper ability to measure and appreciate the good in his own little life. 
Maybe it is that unwilling alteration in his biology which certifies his fate. But it is not Scotty's acrophobia which kills Judy. In fact, it should be a downright preventative for such an act. Vertigo simply doesn't have the comfort of Cowboy Bebop's predeterministic outlook. Scotty's world isn't so much bigger than himself, isn't decided, and at one point in time, he might as well have it all at his fingertips. If Cowboy Bebop submits to predetermination, then Vertigo skirts decided conclusions altogether. There's no hint of a closed book, nothing to indicate prophecy nor ill fate. Yet Vertigo, despite being wholly exclusive of decided outcomes and inevitable tragedies, boasts one of the most discouraging ruinations of a life put to film. And all of it so saddening, because it is perfectly willing.